Welcome back to Psychedelics Today. Uh, we're here today with founder and CEO Joe Moore and with uh, two very special guests um, from PHRI at UC San Diego. PHRI is the Psychedelic Health and Research Initiative. Uh, we're joined today by Dr. Joel Castellanos, as well as Dr. Timothy Furnish, uh, who is a uh, clinical uh, professor in anesthesiology. Uh, Dr. Joel Castellanos was the uh, primary uh, author of a position paper uh, that was a landmark work in psychedelics and pain research, uh, Psychedelics and Chronic Pain, a Review and Proposed Mechanism of Action. Um, we're here today to discuss all the uh, current research that they've been uh bringing forth. And uh, there's a lot of work that is going on at PHRI that we're looking forward to discussing. Uh, so perhaps uh, we could turn it over to the both of you to um, uh, introduce yourselves a little bit more uh, broadly and let us and we'll get into the work you've been doing. Yeah, I can I can start off. So um, my name is Joel Castellanos. I'm the medical director of inpatient rehab at UC San Diego, as well as uh, an associate or assistant professor uh, in the Department of Anesthesia and for the Center of Pain Medicine. So I'm a rehab physician and a pain physician. Uh, my interest came uh, for psychedelics for the use of chronic pain uh, when when Tim and I had a discussion when I was a trainee about neuromodulation and modulating the nervous system, which is a common theme in pain medicine, and how up until this point, people were ignoring the neuromodulatory effects and their uh, potential implications for uh, pain management. Uh, and through that conversation, uh, uh, Dr. Furnish guided me to do my fellow uh, presentation on it, uh, which turned in uh, to a paper that we collaborated on along with uh, uh, Mark Geyer and Adam Halberstadt and Fidel Zidane, uh, and Kelly Bruno, and uh, among others. And uh, that was kind of the birth of uh, the PHRI. Uh, and it's been a really great collaboration so far. And we have a lot of really awesome work to, ahead of us. My fault. And Dr. Furnish. And my name is Tim Furnish. Uh, I'm a clinical professor in the Department of Anesthesia at the Center for Pain Medicine, uh, associate chief of the pain division, uh, and medical director for the PHRI. Uh, I first became interested in this area when a patient of mine who had rolled his ATV out in the desert, crushed his leg, and ended up getting an amputation uh, came and saw me after he was discharged from the hospital with pretty severe phantom limb pain. And he had tried everything. Um, all of the other kind of neuropathic pain drugs that we would typically use like pregabalin or gabapentin or antidepressants like hemotriptyline and nortriptyline, opioids, and none of that really had done anything. He tried smoking cannabis, also totally not effective. Uh, and then he chose to go off and use a full-on psychedelic dose of psilocybin and report came back to me and reported that his pain went to zero, um, which is very unusual for pain drugs to take a severe pain from something that's really high down to zero. And it lasted for a number of hours. And so over the next few weeks, he played around with using lower doses of psilocybin and combining it with, um, and Joel, correct me if I'm saying this wrong, but I would say a quasi-physical therapy technique called mirror visual feedback uh, therapy, uh, which is essentially a way of tricking the brain into seeing uh, the mirror image of a leg or a one leg so that you, you, your brain believes that the missing leg is still there. Uh, and, in, and, in, and it's used for things like phantom limb pain. And over the course of about a month, uh, in combining these lower doses of psilocybin and mirror visual feedback therapy, his pain went to zero and never came back. Um, so this was the basis of a case report, 
uh, that uh, Ramachandran and myself and some others published in around 2018 and also kind of became the catalyst for the PHRI. Uh, and we're ultimately starting a clinical trial for uh, psilocybin to treat phantom limb pain. So currently you're doing, is it, I believe, a, a fully funded two-year neuroimaging fMRI study, fMRI study uh, uh, into psilocybin for phantom limb pain, correct? Uh, correct. So the Cohen Family Foundation uh, has funded this so that we can uh, randomize uh, patients who have phantom limb pain to either psilocybin or an active placebo. And, and then we will use, we will do fMRI studies before they receive psilocybin and then a few weeks after. And we're essentially looking for changes in um, intrinsic brain networks that one sees in chronic pain conditions to see if some of those brain networks start looking more like non-pain patients after they've received psilocybin. So this is some of the same type of cortical reorganization that we're talking about when, say, uh, in Robin Carhart Harris's Rebus model, relaxed belief under psychedelics, where he's talking about, you know, uh, this. If, if we use his analogy of the uh, snow globe, where you uh, you shake up um, the the current sort of rigid fixed. Um, cortical organization that's going on that we see forming around, say, depression or anxiety, PTSD, OCD, take your pick, right? But in this, in a very similar fashion, when we look at um, uh, a pain neurosignature or a neurotag, that's also a sort of a rigid, fixed, not belief so much, but a, a, um, um, a response, right? A, a, often a, a conditioned response. And, and we're hoping to see a very similar type of uh, cortical reorganization that that it goes through while it's going through that so-called entropic or chaotic state where everything is sort of freely connecting. Is that is that accurate? Yeah. So there's there are a variety of these networks, and the one that people talk about a lot with pain is the default mode network. Um, and if you look at the cortical connectivity. Um, involved in the default mode network, and you compare somebody with a chronic pain condition to somebody who doesn't have chronic pain, just like um, he was showing with depression, you're going to see distinct patterns or differences uh, among those two uh, sets of individuals. Um, psychedelics, psilocybin being one of them, vastly increases those uh, cortical connections, or at least temporarily during the, during the psychedelic experience. And one of our theories is that we will be able to open those rigid networks, uh, those rigid pathways of connectivity up so that they can essentially reform in healthier ways, in ways that don't look so much like uh, the pathways you would see in a chronic pain patient. And that may actually change their relationship with the pain. Is it... So, so the, you bring up a, a, a very interesting point there. So, um, you know, broadly, I think within the pain world, there, there's sort of two camps that are uh, approaching it. There's one that's sort of coming from a, a bit more of a psychiatric background. And then there are those that are coming at it more from a, a specific physiatry or uh, um, physical medicine and rehabilitation background like Dr. Castellanos and yourself, where, where you are working specifically with a broad array of pain patients that are coming from all sorts of conditions, but are all trying to treat pain uh, with a variety of interventions, some, some very mechanical and physical, like uh, I, I think there's, what is it, uh, cryoneurolysis, where they're literally uh, going in and say, uh, trying to freeze a nerve in order to uh, create improvements in movement or sensory or motor issues. But then you have uh, other people, as I mentioned before, where they're talking about, uh, um, as you said, a, a reframing of that person's identity as a person in pain or their sense of their relationship to their pain. Uh, there, there's something 
that's known as catastrophizing uh, when it comes to uh, pain patients or say uh, kinesio um, uh, phobia, where people become so sensitized to pain and it's so magnified, they're, they become afraid to move. Do you think uh, your, your paper goes pretty uh, in, in depth and, and maybe Joel can touch on this um, into the other mechanisms of action the, besides the, um, the, that psychological reframing about the pain, do you, do you find yourself more towards one camp or, or the other? Yeah. I mean, uh, for my, I think our paper does a pretty good job of, uh, bringing together the evidence of possible physiologic mechanisms of psilocybin in pain pathways. I don't think that those are necessarily mutually exclusive right. to having uh, a more open uh, response to treatment or having a less rigid uh, mindset when it comes to accepting different types of therapies. Um, I think that those two things can coexist. Uh, in terms of physiologic mechanisms, molecular mechanisms, we all, you know, most of us in the space know that it's the serotonin 2A receptor uh, that has downstream effects not only on uh, genes involved in neuroplasticity, uh, a potent TNF alpha anti inflammatory mechanism, as well as a continued descending inhibition of pain after nerve injury that is unique to the serotonin 2A receptor, uh, along with resetting. Uh, neural networks to a more healthy, more efficient uh, default mode network. So these are all things that that we're kind of gathering and seeing uh, how it translates into clinical practice, I think, is yet to be seen. I think that it will, you know, my my hypothesis is that it will show signal for different types of pain, probably uh, neuropathic pain in particular uh, on its own. But I think it'll also amplify the effectiveness of just about every other treatment through allowing, you know, there, time and time again, these studies are demonstrating that people have more open or ha it kind of opens their mind and they're more, you know, willing to, you know, entertain ideas that are not necessarily their own. So I think that it will allow patients to be more responsive and more accepting of treatments that they previously may not think uh, is something that's going to be effective. So maybe we could back up just a little bit um, and explain <laughs> to people a little bit about, so, so just touching on real quickly something you brought up about uh, TNF-alpha, that's... Uh, um, Tumor necros necrotizing uh, factor, correct? Tumor necrosis factor. Necrosis factor, pardon me. So what is the significance of that and why we're, we would be, say, sort of excited to see um, serotonin um, operating, you know, uh, any type of uh, 5-HT2A uh, agonist, in this case, psilocybin? Why, why is that something that, as, why do we validate that as a signal? Well, it's, it's one of the, it's an acute phase reactant. It's one of the, the molecules, one of the compounds that we measure in the bloodstream to gauge in acute inflammation. And so the fact that it decreases or, you know, it's, it's been shown to decrease TNF alpha demonstrates that there may be some anti-inflammatory effect uh, on, you know, the person. Uh, after taking psilocybin, and if, Court, if, I, if you no, you you said something earlier where you talked about um, cryoneurolysis, for instance, um, and there's there are a variety of ways that pain doctors kind of go after pain, um, right. and anti-inflammatory things like you know antibodies or. Uh, uh, treatments that go after things like TNF alpha, even things like non-steroidal anti-inflammatories that go after inflammation, opioids, um, some of the anti-epileptic drugs we use, antidepressants, 
they all work on a couple of different very broad categories of, of controlling nociception, which is the transmission and processing of pain signals. And they're either decreasing the, uh, they're either suppressing ascending fibers from the periphery to the spinal cord, uh, up through the thalamus, and ultimately they end up at the cortex, or they're engaging what is our descending modulatory system. And so at the brainstem, we have all sorts of processes that allow us to suppress incoming pain information. And various drugs and techniques can actually increase that ability to suppress incoming information. Exercise does that, antidepressants do that, um, distraction techniques certainly do that. Um, you know, soldiers that are shot in battle cannot realize they have any pain because adrenaline can do that as well. One of the things that might be interesting about things like psilocybin or other um, psychedelics is it might work in yet a different way. Um, and so these intrinsic brain networks are engaged in pain processing. Um, and so the default mode network is certainly one of them. They're also engaged in consciousness itself. And so we, the default mode network essentially becomes very active when we are thinking about ourselves, when we're engaged in kind of internal processes like memory or thinking about past events or future events or daydreaming, for instance. And it gets suppressed when we're focused on tasks that are outside of us, solving puzzles, uh, doing some sort of specific task. Um, and that, that default mode network is heavily involved in, in kind of a sense of self and consciousness. Um, one of the things that may be unique about or interesting about chronic pain is that the longer it goes on, the more people start seeing pain as a part of their identity. And that default mode network is probably playing a role in that. And it's possible that something like psychedelics could open up the possibility of changing that internal story uh, so that pain is no longer so much a part of one's identity. So Joe here uh, put up a hand uh, when we started talking about pain and identity. Um, uh, he, he's, I think I can bring this up since he's brought it up on the podcast before. We don't have a HIPAA relationship court. You're good. <laughs> But yeah, um, so chronic pain uh, forever, massive amount of injuries, uh, snowboarding, skateboarding, a lot of concrete to body things and height to body things and torn tendons, cartilage, et cetera. So, you know, um, I believe psychedelics have helped me recover quite a bit. I think without psychedelics, I'd be in a much worse physical chronic pain state, done tons of physical therapy. I was probably in physical therapy weekly for a good two years uh, straight weekly and then, you know, regularly months. So, you know, personal interest here too. But Court, where were you going to go with my story? So, so if, if we, I'm, I'm trying to tie it back to um, um, the identity Dr. thing. Saying, but I certainly did so identify good. with it for sure. But, you know, yes. there's a lot of really cool things you can distract yourself with these days. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I mean... I think that it's it's so easy for it to become part of your identity when you're when you're in chronic pain, when you're having pain day after day, the majority of days for over three months, that it causes, you know, it causes you to be socially isolated. Your friends don't want to hang out with you anymore because you're just complaining about pain. Uh, you know, it causes you to not be able to go to work. It causes you to not be able to do the things that make you feel like you. And it slowly invades. It slowly invades and becomes a big part of who you are and part of your identity. And I mean, uh, I think I can probably speak for Tim uh, as well as myself when I say we see this all the time. We see this in clinic every day where patients are have lost who they are. Uh, and they're, that's my favorite part about what we do is we're able to partner with them and, and figure out ways, uh, figure out them, you know, get to know them as people get to know how they interact with their pain and 
try one thing at a time to see how we can bring them closer to, to who they were before this pain started to take over their life. One thing that I think is really unique about UC San Diego, our, our Center for Pain Medicine, is we have you know, Tim is an anesthesiologist. I'm a physical medicine and rehabilitation physician. We have several anesthesiology uh, trained pain physicians as well as PM&R trained physicians, but we also have uh, emergency medicine trained uh, pain physicians as well as neurology trained uh, pain physicians. So we really, as well as two full-time uh, pain psychologists. So we really do have this multidisciplinary clinic where we're all working together, throwing things by each other in clinic and can each see these patients through our own lens and collaborate in a way that really allows for optimum patient care. I think it's a, a, a true strength of our department. Would you mind describing um, uh, both or, you know, uh, individually a little bit about what has changed over the last 10 to 15 years in terms of our working models for pain, how we've kind of come forward to this so-called pain neuromatrix or the biopsychosocial model, maybe um, not so much that we've moved away from sort of a more mechanistic view, but that there's a little bit more of a, a, a top-down realization as in terms of what the interaction is between the um, central and peripheral nervous system. I mean, I, you know, I think that people oftentimes confuse pain with simply nerves firing. Um, and you're right, the, the, um, that we don't really view pain as simply um, nerves firing in the periphery when somebody is injured uh, and traveling up the spinal cord, that there is this, this rich interplay between the way we think about pain, the way we perceive pain and how we feel about it. Um, you know, when we talked about, um, the psychedelics, there are other things that, that we employ that can act on that more psychological, um, kind of lever to deal with pain. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy certainly does that. Uh, mindfulness meditation certainly does that. Um, but it's possible that psychedelics could influence or augment or, um, kind of make those other things work better. So you, you, you've mentioned before, uh, and this will go into a little explanation, but picking up on what you're just saying. Um, so we have these signals coming from the receptors, right? These nociceptive or, or noxious slash pain receptors out on that peripheral nervous system and they're ascending um, up what are known as the afferent, right? Afferent spinal pathways. Afferent is ascending, going towards the brain, right? And then the stuff that emerges is the efferent signaling, right? And I, I, I think what you're touching on is that, um, you know, people think they're still operating with this kind of Cartesian 500 year old model that, you know, pain is a sensation that's felt by receptors in the, in the body, but in fact, that's an input, right? That it's, you, you're sensing it, there's like damage or something, you're sensing that through the nerves and then that's ascending and you're, you're feeling the pain, right? But in fact, and as you hinted, like, you know, uh, battlefield soldiers and other people in severe injury accidents will often feel no pain at all at the time of injury and that in fact pain is an output of the central nervous system that's a perception or a you know often a motor response or a lack of motor response and um when we're talking about you know why is this uh you know going back to the formation of phri with the albert lynn vs ramachandran case study about his phantom limb pain right he lost his limb and lost the sensation in that limb. And more importantly, you know, so what are known as the, the afferent signaling. So that's de-afferentation, right? So when, when we're talking about psychedelics and uh, augmenting other therapies, uh, in, in both cases, and you touched on this before, when he did the psychedelics alone, right? He had that great analgesic or pain relieving effect for, you know, in, in some cases, I think up to like 19 hours, if I remember, 
Uh, and then when he's doing the uh, mirror visual feedback or the uh, mirror box therapy, you know, he sticks his limb into this angled mirror. He sticks his missing limb, the, the stump under the angled mirror, and then ref looks down at the reflection of his remaining hand, uh, and, or in this case, his, uh, his leg, I'm sorry. Um, and that's enough of an input for that somatosensory strip in his brain to actually replace that missing afferent input, right? But as soon as he stops doing it, here comes back the pain. Yet he combines these together, right? And suddenly it becomes sticky. It's enduring. That pain relieving quality persists beyond him, beyond the acute phase of that dosing. He's no longer, he's not doing it, uh, the, the mirror box therapy minute to minute. And so, you know, and when you look at the depression studies, you know, it's one single large dose. And then there's people that are out of depression, you know, often treatment re resistant depression for like a year or more at a time. Um, you know, not everybody, but many. So. Where... And in those studies, they combined the, the psilocybin with psychotherapy. Yes, it did. wasn't simply <laughs> here's a drug now yes, go home. Right. Thank you. <laughs> That's right. It, it, there's, you know, um, there's, there's some spontaneous cases out in the wild, but, but yes, it is. So it's, it's an, is it safe to say this is an impact booster for neuroplasticity and that neuroplasticity is, can be induced by more than just psychedelics, right? Often in any of our physiotherapy approaches, any of our neuromodulation modulation approaches, we are trying to induce, even with the, the cryoneurolysis, right? Um, though that's very mechanical, right? Even that is trying to induce enough of a change in the inputs that it's changing what's going on up in the central nervous Could system. Could that so be classified as a neuroplastic state inducer? Like in a rough, really rough like <laughs> sense, or is that kind of far off? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that, you know, with, with cryoablation, um, we're really trying to get, you know, remove that nociceptive afferent input. I think uh, a, a more uh, clean, uh, like, like a spinal cord stimulation or peripheral nerve stimulation, where we're, where we're trying to change the electrical impulse, input uh, afferently, uh, is kind of a way that we're trying to induce neuroplasticity almost elect like not almost elect electronically. That's super interesting. But even physical therapy is is in part about um, some neuroplasticity. You know, if you've if you if people have stopped moving in ways because they hurt, and they've learned that moving hurts, it starts changing things in the brain mm -hmm. to expect that pain and to, to continue protecting it, and then you get further loss of function. Um, you know, part of physical therapy is literally getting more motion there, but part of it is probably inducing some neuroplasticity as you continue to gain function, um, and your brain learns that you can do that without, you know, being in terrible pain. Yeah, I mean, I think if you, if you really think about, you know, neuroplasticity broadly, um, and I'll just for an example, I'll talk, you know, you, we see patients who say, oh, I had, I've, I've gone to several different physical therapists and, you know, not, I didn't really get better, but I had this one physical therapist who, who was really able to kind of get me to a better place. I think you hear those stories all the time. And I think that, you know, sometimes it's not necessarily that, that physical therapist has this secret set of clinical knowledge that these other physical therapists didn't have, but maybe that, that patient physician or that patient provider relationship is allowing that patient to be more open and be more entertaining of, of trying things and, and gradually stepping outside of their comfort zone. And so if, if, if we can find a substance, whether it's psychedelic or not, that can push people to, to, to be more open to different types of therapies and be on board with it, that's awesome. If it also has a direct mechanistic effect on uh, pain perception, then it's then it's a, a double whammy, really.
And that's, you know, I think that's where we think the, the potential really is with this, that if, if, it can, if it can not only decrease afferent pain perception, but also allow every type of therapy to be amplified in its efficacy through, through opening the patient up to different ideas, then it could be a really big, big thing for pain and for our chronic pain patients. What's it going to take to really prove this in in a clinical sense that other big institutions is it is it like something like your RCT that you're working on? Absolutely. I mean, we 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 clearly need well done randomized controlled trials. Um, you know, the, if we look back in the um, you know pre nineteen uh, seventies uh, um, uh, anti drug movement, there were some studies some very small studies done for cancer pain, um, for phantom limb pain, um, but they were largely not well controlled or they were just case series. Um, and that's not going to be very convincing. Certainly is not going to get people access to this through the FDA approval process and the insurance coverage process. Um, so really to get this out there, um, we need this to be an FDA approved um, drug that we can use in clinical settings. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I mean, I, I think that, you know, I think that we're for, for our phantom limb pain trial, we're trying to answer one of the basic questions, right? Uh, is there, is there a signal without the use of mirror box therapy? Is there a signal between improvement in phantom limb pain uh, after giving someone a psychedelic substance. We have to, that's one of the first things we have to answer. I think that there's a lot of, there's more questions than there are answers right now. Does a patient have to have uh, a psychedelic experience uh, if the compound is working on the serotonin 2A receptor for uh, there to be inferred benefit? Um yeah. good question. Crazy question though. You know, are I, there other, are there prescribable medications right now that are specifically 5-HT2A um, agonists? Single, single receptor site? Not, not, not that, that are I'm like, not that are specifically, uh, and specifically and only working on the serotonin 2A, I would say court. I mean, you I chatted with the mind. lab the other day and they have a whole host of these, but they're absolutely only in animals currently. Um, I mean, the, there there used to be things like uh, lice, lyceride, lysiceride. I think I'm hopefully I'm getting that at one point that was legal. And then there was like a, a BOL that you see uh, being used within the uh, cluster headache community. But were these psychedelic that's not available anymore? So they they they, they weren't specifically okay. psychedelic. Great. Um, and, and, and as a matter of fact, they were uh, um, they were kind of coveted a little bit because of their non-psychedelic qualities and they were also neurochemically promiscuous. Um, so, you know, being a derivative of uh, LSD, but, but not having any type of uh, psychedelic effect um, people are, which is a, a big part of the investigation here is like at what level can these be used and not interfere with day-to-day -day activities? Because, sure. you know, if you're talking about taking like a, a high dose um, uh, of psilocybin or, or LSD or, or, you know, what have you, um, obviously that's got some durational effects that you've got to. <laughs> right. My lifestyle would have while, to be really but, specific yeah. to be able to handle that. I don't think that's like yeah. in my pipeline. Um, so and, and BOL, I think you're right. It, it was uh, it's related to LSD, but it has no um, hallucinogenic component to it. And I know in the some of the kind of survey data re regarding cluster headache, it definitely um, was able to decrease um, the frequency of these cluster headache attacks um, without generating any psychedelic components. So the question about whether or not that would happen. Um, with other drugs, I think is certainly an interesting question. Um, you know, there's very little bit of data about microdosing or low doses of, of um, psychedelics and whether or not they have analgesic properties. Um, 
And Joel and I have a, a small case series that's just getting published of three different subjects who were microdosing. Um, I think all of them psilocybin um, and reporting no overt or really sig- you know, large psychedelic experience with the, these various doses, but getting pain relief. I think that one of the interesting questions for me is, you know, as Joel was kind of talking about potential analgesic mechanisms of action, are these microdoses working in one way, but really macro doses working in a completely different way? Um, and, you know, again, more questions than we have answers so far. Hmm. That's interesting. Do we have any data on um, or speculation on what kind of dose um, was happening in this uh, ATV accident with the Mirabox therapy? Dose is uh, super so hard his, in mushrooms. His initial, I know. his initial dose, he described as um, a, a major psychedelic dose. Um, but I don't know if he ever quantified that in terms of like, because he was using dried mushrooms, um, how many grams of mushroom that was. Um, but uh, that's you know, true. Yeah, we can't really speculate. Three to five gram range, I believe. Okay, great. Thank you for that, Tim. Yeah, and just listeners should be reminded that the variability is insane. Court, go ahead. Yeah. Well, I mean, right. So from, you know, uh, from cap to stem, from flesh to flesh, you know, from one species to the next, the the uh, concentration of psilocybin varies wildly. That's why a lot of people are trying to homogenize it and, you know, doing it capsule by capsule, trying to see if they can get something that can be somewhat consistently predicted. Um, in your case series, so I, I just want to um, to note uh, for, for people that, that don't know this, their, their case series was published in Pain Journal, um, which is the preeminent um, uh, international it's it's published by the international association for the study of pain iasp for this to have been published this case series in particular to have been published within pain journal is a is a major milestone uh and uh it's it it's catching attention as as a direct result everyone there were three uh i'll let you guys talk about it in a second since it's yours (laughs) but um uh each person uh in that uh, case series uh, had very severe chronic pain, had gone through standard of care for, for quite a long time. All of them did a macro dose first, but then to maintain the, the lower psychedelic effects, yet preserving that pain uh, relieving quality, they switched to micro doses. So that's where I'd like to hand it off to you guys, because the I think it's a very profound uh, case series, it, even as small as it is, and we could claim it's underpowered, um, I think as far as an, an anecdotal based report goes, it's, it's pretty significant. Yeah. I think the, the one thing that I found interesting, one thing that I liked about it is how much autonomy the patients had in it. Like they, uh, were finding the dose that was, uh, most functionally beneficial to them. Uh, and then the other thing that we kind of gathered from that case series was that when they, when they compiled it with physical therapy or a home exercise program, they inferred longer benefits. Um, I thought that was uh, one of the interesting thing, one of the mo- more interesting things that we kind of found on that study. You know, just for your listeners, I'll, I will say we have no data for the long-term low dose daily use of psychedelics in terms of safety. Um, and so we're not, promoting that as an idea yet. I think that it, we need a lot more study. Um, we're simply reporting what people have um, chosen to do on their own and what they have seen um, as a result. Um, you know, clearly, when we look at um, the variety of, of uh, drugs that are Schedule One and the the what safety data or, or what risk data we have from them. Psychedelics are on the low end of that, but most of that is from recreational use. And most people are not recreationally using psilocybin and LSD on a daily basis. Um, that's just not, um, not probably the, the usual pattern. And so when we translate that to, well, you're going to take a dose every single day because this is your treating your pain, 
it could become a very different scenario. Mm. And maybe if, we can make that explicit, we... the danger, real quick. There is speculation, and I like to do this just out of an abundance of caution, but also kind of deflating the paranoia just a little bit. But, you know, really, um, there is some speculation around cardiac risk, thickening of uh, valves, and uh, we see this uh, with, what was it, FenFen in some baseball players. There was some serious cardiac issues there. Um, people died. Um, you know, my... Well, I began as well. Right, right, right. Different pathway, though, right? Um, that yeah, was yeah, what yeah. QT elongation or something like that. And mm -hmm. um, yeah. right, so serotonin, serotonergic psychedelics like psilocybin being uh, acting on very similar receptor sites, and there could 5 be 5HT2B, 5HT2B, and there could be some situations that could come up. That said, you know, I we know of N of ones. Amanda Fielding had a Beckley Research uh, Foundation. She was a daily LSD user for a, well over decades, and uh, well, maybe at least a decade. Uh, zero cardiac issues. Um, but what about all the deadheads and like all the folks from the '60s? And you know, this is all speculative. We do need data. I just want to like couch this paranoia a little bit because people are killing themselves over this pain also actively also the cluster headache community. Mm. Like I've, I've spoken Fair. at length about this with Bob Wald, Robert Wald, the founder and CEO of Cluster Busters, as well as Eileen Brewer. When you look at that cohort, they, they are not having cardiac issues that are, are attributable to uh, psychedelic use. You know, I mean, obviously there's a lot of co-founders, co confounders, sorry. Um, but, uh, it's, I think it's it's a worthy uh, thing to be very uh, concerned with, uh, you know, or, or I think that's a population of. we should try to get a study on, Court. Um, just the cluster well. community generally and their cardiac situation. Like, that would be really a fascinating cohort to look at to see if there's anything there. You, you know, I, I mean, I, I would love to do anything with them. But, uh, <laughs> right. You know. Uh, Could we get into your RCT a little bit more? Like, what, what is this RT, RCT exactly that you're working on? Sure. Uh, so we're looking for, we're currently recruiting. Um, we're looking at uh, patients who have uh, had an amputation that have phantom limb pain. Single limb. Is single limb. Uh, that are, have significant amounts of phantom limb pain. And, uh, you know, there's a, a variety of other um, criteria for that we have to, you know, that either we felt like were important to, to, to kind of create a, a relatively robust um, population that we can safely um, test this in. Uh, some of them were that were foisted on us by the FDA as well. Um, and then if they are able to be enrolled, they will be randomized, either get um, a dose of 25 uh, micro 25 milligrams of synthetic THC, um, so pure THC, so, or uh, psilocybin. Uh, sorry, psilocybin or um, healthy dose of niacin. either. 100 wow. milligrams. 100 milligrams of niacin. Yeah. Um, Thanks, Joel. Good catch. Yeah, um, it's a substantial dose of either. So, what kind of uh, size are you looking for in the in like how many people do you want to push through the study? So the first phase of it, we're going to do a single dose of either the niacin or the psilocybin. Um, and we're looking to do at least 10 subjects. And this is really kind of giving us a chance to get our feet wet, make sure that we've got our processes down um, and that we are kind of gathering the data that we want to gather. And then we'll move on to a second phase where we'll do at least another 30 subjects where they will get two dosing sessions. Um, that are separated by at least a couple of weeks uh, so that we can look at the idea of whether or not dosing twice has a more robust or profound effect than just doing it once. Why did you choose psilocybin specifically here? Part of this was that was the drug that Albert Lin used um, in our original case report. Um, part of that was that uh, the um, USONA Foundation 
was willing to, you know, is synthesizing um, psilocybin in a way that can be given to humans um, through GCP or good, good clinical practice techniques, uh, and was a willing to donate that to us. Uh, so we essentially chose the drug based on uh, those two criteria. That's fair. Yeah, yeah, and I think, I mean, I think the, the studies that had been done in, on phantom limb pain in the 60s and 70s also, you know, it was either going to be psilocybin or LSD. And because Albert Lynn had historical benefit from psilocybin and we had, we had less hoops to jump through in terms of uh, making the study feasible, it just made sense. It's true. It's probably a lot easier when there's a ton of active studies on this right now. And uh, it's already been granted breakthrough status for other conditions. So that, that probably makes a lot of sense. And there, if you look on the um, clinicaltrials.gov website and look at pain studies that are um, that have been posted that are in the process, um, actually recruiting or working on getting ready to recruit, almost all of them are using psilocybin uh, that are looking at psychedelics specifically. I think there may be one or two headache related studies looking at LSD. Mm, great. It's really interesting. Could you describe a little bit about the sort of unusual nature that uh, phantom limb pain causes relative to other pains in terms of like the uh, what's going on with the um, the patient that has it? Like, uh, you know, we're we talk about pain and, and most people, they sort of think to their own relevant experience of like, you know, severe headaches or when they've been sick or something like that, or, or maybe in a, in a car accident, but phantom limb pain, um, as far as chronic pains go, uh, tends to be a bit more involved and intense than that. Could you discuss that a little bit? Yeah. I mean, I, I think that there's a wide, there's a wide spectrum of people's experience through, uh, suffering and amputation. Uh, patients, some patients have some phantom limb sensation where it just feels like they're, so if they had a below knee amputation, it feels like their toes are in an odd position, but it's not necessarily painful or they, they have, they have a sensation of, of itchiness or pruritus all the way to the very end of the spectrum where they have constant severe pain that feels like their foot is on fire, that their, 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 their foot is constantly being jabbed, uh, or struck by lightning or jabbed by, by needles. Um, and it's, it can be really difficult to treat. We have things that, that can ameliorate the symptoms somewhat, but when we hear in the, as pain clinicians, when we hear that someone has had their pain completely resolved, it makes us perk up a little bit. And not to mention, sure, the pain on it, the pain itself is terrible. It can be debilitating. It can can seriously cause people to want to end their life because the pain is that severe. But when you're having that bad of, of pain, it's really hard to use a prosthetic as well. And so it's very, the pain experience is, func is, is limiting, but it also causes functional limitations because they can't use a prosthetic to be able to get up and walk and continue to kind of to, to, to move forward and maybe participate in activities that distract them from it. So it's like a, it's like a, it, it causes disability in several different ways. Yeah, I had a, 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 patient uh, a few years ago that was describing what that phantom limb pain could feel like. And I, there was a couple of very descriptive ways that he would describe it. Um, and in, in some cases, he would say it would feel uh, like his ankle was being bent up so that his toes could touch the front of his calf, um, if you can imagine that. And in other at other times, he would have this horrific shooting pain when he defecated or when he ejaculated. And if you can think about, uh, you know, not a lot of pains get described in those kinds of ways. 
um, it, it's, it, it can be quite graphic. So I've, I've specifically talked about that aspect uh, that a lot of people don't realize that many of those that have certainly lower limb, phantom limb pain also have this accompanying spreading pain into other functions because of related nerves. So urinating, defecating, uh, ejaculation, orgasm, that all of those things are also, they're brief windows of solace that nearly all of us look to for relief. That those are those are moments where like, at least this is coming up and I'll be able to, you know, uh, that'll be my moment of, you know, uh, just some type of, if, if not specifically pleasure, uh, uh, an absence of of discomfort because I'm, I'm now relieving myself in, in whichever way. And now that becomes something that's almost a landmine. And like when you talk about the, this is sort of the bizarre aspects of this and why I think what you're doing is is so vital because it, it, it carries over to so many other types of pain, but that um, when we talk about the demoralization that can occur and the loss of identity um, that occurs to people with chronic pain and almost it's, it's not a persecution complex, but it starts to get ontological for some of them why is this happening to me? You know, why would this thing happen? And and then if you get back into sort of a, a neuro, not neuromechanical, but a, a neurological basis, just that loss of um, pleasurable or relieving sensation, it, it just lets the anhedonia or the loss of pleasure uh, build up. And like, you know, um, with these, uh, uh, ascending signals of pain just being unmitigated you know for you know essentially forever like this is how we you know the 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 body goes through this association or learning stage into more pain it gets really good at feeling pain and it starts to feel pain more easily but I, i i think um i think when there's nothing to look forward to physically that's that's where we start getting into like you know pretty, pretty severe areas. Yeah. Tim and I, uh, just last week had a really interesting conversation. He's giving a talk at Azra coming up, uh, on, you know, psychedelics and pain and suffering and like the difference between pain and suffering and what, what, what should we really be focusing on? You know, I would challenge any of the listeners to, to really think about that regardless of how, how severe that pain is. But every time you have to, you know, void, or have a bowel movement, or have an orgasm, that 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 is now a, a, a painful experience. Uh, I, I I would imagine that that would make me feel very trapped in my life, because those are all things that have to occur several times throughout the day. You know, like those are those are pillars. You know, those are things that happen in the day, and we all just take it for granted. We all we all take it. You know, it's not. We don't even think about it. But if you think about how many times, you know, uh, you urinate or have a bowel movement and, and that's attributed and that's associated with severe debilitating pain, you know, that's someone who is really suffering, uh, regardless of how bad the pain is. Um, when they're kind of flanked uh, by that impending doom of the next the next time that they have to, to evacuate or void, it's it's really sad. And it, 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 I think when, when you're not really dealing with uh, chronic or severe pain on a daily basis, it's really hard to think about how life changing that is um, or can be. And, and that's where we start to see the development of certain types of kinesiophobia, fear of movement. And in this case, it's like, there's, there, there, there are, compounding health and mental health complications that that arise out of that because it's like if you are avoiding defecating if you are avoiding urinating you know that that is that is not a normal setup um and and that that just like you know we can imagine what it's doing to the renal system yeah a lot of downstream effects yes yeah so like you know when we hear things like it's it's only just in your head you know, I, I don't think people quite get, um, you know, the, the head can be a scary place to be trapped sometimes. 
Um, I think that's an important point, Court, because I think a lot of pain patients hear even discussions of something like cognitive behavioral therapy or mindfulness meditation as somebody telling them that their pain is not real. And that's so not the case. And, you know, what I will often try, you know, it's very hard to, um, you know, as somebody who doesn't live with chronic pain every day to have those conversations and some, and not trigger people into feeling like they're not being believed that there's something seriously wrong because there is, they have chronic pain and it, that's serious. That's a serious problem. Um, but at the same time, we experience brain pain in our brain. And if we didn't have, you know, a somatosensory cortex, there would be no pain to experience no matter what's happening in the body. Um, and so it's, it's, it's impossible to separate that emotional component from the actual sensory delivery of noxious stimuli. Where, <laughs> so there's a lot of revision going on right now around the use of say the mystical experience questionnaire uh there, there's talk of renaming that you know into like oceanic boundlessness or um you know or or sort of a meaningfulness quotient or something like that Yet, when we look at the earliest studies at, say, Hopkins or, or even Imperial, say, around depression, right, um, and some of the other studies since then, and, and we look at this quality of, like, the, the stronger rating that a person puts on a mystical experience, if they had one during their session, for those type of situations, right, and their response outcomes, for, for mental health situations, right? Does that play a factor here when we're talking about pain or is it is it kind of a little bit of um, a, a spectrum where maybe, you know, as in your case series, as in the Albert Lynn case report, like their first experiences, you know, quite large, quite large and obviously experience the full psychedelic effect, but for their day to day, you know, they're maintaining with with microdoses, which and even just seeing the word microdose right now is somewhat <laughs> uh, controversial, though I, I, I strongly think there's a case to be made that pathological populations are, are more responsive. But where where does something something like a mystical experience fit within the pain experience and the resolution of pain when we're going from, you know, you know, you you open it up in the beginning, and uh, I, I said this with Joe. It's a really good distraction on the webisode about your about your case series. And excuse me if I get a bit emotional here, but I said, you know, the language you guys are using in this case series sounds very dry, sounds very measured, but really, in in terms of like when you read study after study after study about interventions in pain, you guys are like screaming, in my opinion, you know, like when people are going down to zero in an hour, you know, after they've been fighting pain for years, or, you know, month after month after month, like pain that goes to, you know, on a scale of one to 10 to 10, and hangs out around a seven daily, you know, and then it's down at zero within an hour. And then it persists. You know, what, <laughs> where are we within the, you know, this, I, I kind of describe it from the transpersonal to the transdiagnostic, you know, if we're looking at it from a biopsychosocial model, where does that fit in this? I think that that answer or that question is yet to be deter you know, yet to be answered. I think we, you know. Um, I mean, I've had several anesthesiology colleagues ask me like, okay, so can we just put, can we put these patients who are in chronic pain asleep, um, uh, under an general anesthesia and give them a huge dose of psychedelics, uh, and then wake them up and are they going to be better? You know, like I, 
I don't know. Uh, you know, how important is is it for that person to go through that that mystical experience or that journey? You know, I think for people who have a very externalized locus of control, I think that experience is very important uh, because it's like, OK, like I'm I'm doing this on my own. You know, like it's it's an actual, you know, experience and a journey and it can be really challenging. And that's why you need to have the support uh, to, to be able to help patients through that. Um, but, you know, to be determined. I think that if 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 we can find the the a compound that infers all the benefits without having uh, patients to necessarily need to be intoxicated or inebriated or you know in a in a vulnerable state, I think that that's that may be attractive to some people. Um, but you know that's another thing that that I think we as you know this is a little bit off topic, but as you know psychedelics become decriminalized and as we're we're getting more people trained up in how to administer psychedelics uh we really need to be careful about who we're training and and, and making sure we set up safeguards to protect these vulnerable patients um because it's not going to take much for this whole movement that we know has so much potential to become something if, if if patients are taken advantage of, becomes something totally different. Um, and I think that's that's one of the, the biggest Achilles heels of the psychedelic uh, clinical movement right now. Mm. As I think we've hit an hour court, so I think we should wrap. And that's an amazing note to stop on, Joel, because there is a lot that we could lose here. I, I, I tend to hesitate that um, all of this money in biotech right now and all of the medical promise i think we're at a different phase now than we were in the 60s so i i hold hope that even if this does happen in the wild that we're going to do okay here in in a more contained medicalized clinical you know research-based framework but i totally hear your concern and we do have to take that very seriously so folks like see something say something you know it's absolutely i think it's really yeah. important if you if 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 anyone cares about at least answering the questions that to see what this what patient population this is going to be most effective for, we have to really protect the vulnerable. You know, we have to make sure that we're doing this in the right way. No, oh, amazing. Um, Tim, Joel, Court, thank you so much. And uh, let's hang out for a minute, uh, just so the audio syncs. And um, well, actually, anything else you want to say? Uh, closing thoughts? closing remarks. All right, great. All right. I really appreciate your time and I, I hope we can do it again. Thank you for having us. Yeah. I think it was a long time coming. Great conversation. I, I just hope that we can continue to kind of like, you know, walk this path together. I mean, I think, you know, the advocacy, Joe, that you've done through psychedelics today. And I mean, we both know how passionate Cord is about all of this and how well he I mean, he knows the, the psychedelic pain space like the back of his hand. Um, I really hope that we continue to kind of push things forward in a way that is the right way. Wholeheartedly agree. Well, thank you all again. Well, I just, of course, I can't thank the three of you enough. Like Joe has been uh, so supportive of this from day one, day one, so open to the conversation, so eager to make sure that this is getting put out there. And then in terms of what you guys are doing at PHRI, I, I think it is going to completely change the the future of, of pain medicine. It is going to become a, an entirely new, a new chapter, a vital new chapter that's, that's so needed and necessary. So I, I can't thank you enough for what you and your, uh, your colleagues are doing out there. All right, everybody Appreciate until it. next time. All right, we'll talk. Have a good one.